FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and it's 12, 12, 18, getting close to the end of the year. Hey, no trading profits for you. That seems to be the theme of the year. Hey, as always, we invite you to be a part of the show, to join us in the dialogue, the discussion. And you can do that by emailing me at kl at kerrylutz.com. Hey, our good friend here is back with us. Adam Mesh, and you can find him at adammesh.com. That's A-D-A-M-M-E-S-H.com. Adam, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Carrie. It's a pleasure to be here. Hey, so if we ever needed your stock coaching program, we probably need it now, don't we, more than ever? You know, it's a great time to be an individual trader when you have no allegiances to up or down because the volatility just creates opportunity and that's certainly what we're seeing with 500 point swings becoming a part of our daily activity. Yeah. And all of a sudden the VIX uh, is looking rather vo- volatile after having been a sleeper for the past year and a half where it was, you know, trading between eight to 11 all time lows. And the good thing about the VIX, I guess, is when you buy it and it goes up, then, you know, you can dump it because it has to go down in the future due to the way that it's constructed, right? Yeah, the VIX is a, is a tricky, um, mind-messing vehicle for playing the market. So my typical holding period for the VIX is around seven minutes, <laughs> if I'm trading seven minutes? to give you an idea. Uh, that's cool. So anyway, so you're Joe Sixpack, you're an investor. All of a sudden it's dawning on you that maybe – Maybe the bull market has run finally run out of steam. Maybe it's uh, time to start playing the downside. What is a Joe Sixpack supposed to do? Well, the, the biggest opportunities to benefit from this market will come from the market going lower. The market was really overvalued. We were seeing incredible uh, price to earnings ratios and the, it was a daunting test to buy in up there, expecting a lot more. The lower we go, the better it is over time for the upside that we could have. And what I always tend to do is I appreciate a market like this because when you have a down market, when you, well, let's go inverse. When you have an up market, it's very hard to separate strong from weak because everything's up. Mm-hmm. But when you have a weak market, the strong stocks show their true colors because they're resistant um, and they're not getting carried down with the rest of the market. So two great examples I'll give you. Um, I think I own one of them, not the other right now. I own Twitter, not PayPal. But PayPal, you know, when Apple was down over 20% and Facebook was down over 30% and Wynn was down almost 50% and NVIDIA and Netflix were all beat up, PayPal stayed within a 10-point range. And it remains very strong. And anytime we go up, you see PayPal leading the charge. The very strong stock in the weak market, those are the kind of stocks I like to trade. Twitter is another example. Didn't really get hit with the rest of the market, remained very strong. And as soon as we have an update, Twitter has been on fire the last couple of days leading the charge. Uh, And it becomes, for me, an easier way to trade because these stocks stood out and it makes sense that they're stronger because they weren't going down as much. So the, the, Error, the error that, that people will do, and hopefully we can prevent it by having this conversation on the show, is, you know, they'll say, well, Apple's down 60 points. If the market rebounds, I got to buy Apple. No, Apple led the market down. Mm-hmm. Apple's the, one of the reasons the market's down. <laughs> Don't buy what brought us down. Buy what never wanted to go down because it's going to go up when we go up. Mm-hmm. Um, so looking for the weakest stocks as a rebound play is the wrong move. You want to target stocks that have remained strong in a weak market, like a PayPal, like a Twitter. Hey, and that's fascinating. You know what other sectors stayed pretty darn strong throughout this, uh, throughout these uh, buffeting forces striking the market is uh, the dividend aristocrat group. Barely budged. I mean, down a couple percent, not much, right? Yeah, that's not very much surprising because 
that's a flight to safety. So when you get nervous with the speculative stocks, you want to move more into dividends. Um, I remember in 2008, 2009, that, um, you know, stocks like a Verizon and AT&T um, were, the, were the safe places to go uh, when the market was falling apart. Hey, so, but the interesting thing is you would expect if we're going to have rising interest rates, that the dividend aristocrats, because they kind of trade as a bond surrogate, if you will, would get hit. So maybe the dividend aristocrats are telling us that this round of rate hikes is all but over, and we're going to look forward to lower rate hikes uh, in the not too, di- or rate cuts, I should say, in the not too distant future. Is that perhaps what the that combined with the bond yield, which is now the ten years under three percent? Again, uh, maybe that's what it's telling us. Well, the, the Fed had been, well, the market had been factoring in uh, three to four um, rate hikes next year, and now they're only factoring in uh, one. So we've already seen that. And, and that is a warning I'd give about the market overall is, you know, you only have so many um, uh phone of friends, so to speak, mm-hmm. where you could say, we're going to do this and that will save the market. You know, so you could have good news about tariffs come in. You could have less rate hikes. Uh, but overall, if the trend remains down in the market and what we've seen is any rally lately has been sold into. Um, yes. So the more good news you try to throw at a market that's getting hit, uh, there's nothing left to help you if it continues to go down. Um, so I, you know, I remain bearish. The world makes more sense to me when the markets come back like this, because I thought for 10 years, you know, I stopped believing in the market years ago, incorrectly, <laughs> you know, candidly, yeah, I was hey. like two years too early on. Um, Same here, brother. When I thought, <laughs> what, you too? Yeah, really. I've uh, yeah. felt it's a fake uh, rally and a fake uh, bull market just brought on by, ultra easy money and high liquidity and the money's got to go someplace. So if it's not going into, it's going into trophy real estate, it's going into trophy artwork and it's going into trophy stocks. All right. So we're on the same page then because yeah, I, I, I stopped believing it long before. So for me, I was like, are you concerned? I'm like, no, my, my world makes sense when I see the market come down. Um, and, and that's a big thing, though, also is in your trophy collection, let's add buybacks mm-hmm. because we saw massive stock buybacks yes. and a rising interest rate environment is going to be bad for the companies that did that. Um, and, and that's really what I thought propelled the market more than anything is these companies buying their own stocks and that erroneous trade, which I was always mm-hmm. against. Um, Same here. Seems to, seems to be uh, unwinding a little bit, but it's certainly not unwound. Um, yeah. So I think that's if I, if you ask me, the greatest risk facing the market is that these companies who bought back their stock to see their stocks go lower mm-hmm. um, are going to have problems with that. Yes, um, I'm totally uh, in accord with you on this, Adam, and I think that. Uh, you know, the, when I went to school, when I went to college, I admit it was a long, long time ago. Uh, you know, when we did financial analyst analysis on industrial companies, mature companies, it was always like basically they should have uh, roughly one third debt. One third of their capital should be debt and two thirds should be uh, should be equity. And and that held for a long time. And if it was a little bit higher, if you were at 75%, so you had a three to one debt to equity, uh, equity to debt ratio, that was even better. But somehow all of these, all of these uh, tried and true concepts have been tossed out the window, haven't they? FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. 
Egypt is on the verge once again becoming a world-renowned gold producer. The golden age is being rediscovered. For millennia, ancient Egyptian kingdoms prospered from unparalleled riches. Pharaohs built their empires and flaunted their abundant wealth that was made possible by the country's resource-rich gold deposits. Despite this rich history, modern Egypt remains one of the most underdeveloped gold mining countries in the world. Aton Resources is at the center of the modern Egyptian mining world, diligently working both as the only public exploration company in Egypt today and as the advocate for mining reform with the Egyptian government. However, those that arrive early like Aton will reap the best rewards. Aton's discovery of the legendary lost mountain of gold at Rod Ruin and its current aggressive drilling program there could potentially reap those rewards. Aton Resources is focused on its 100% owned Abu Marawat concession in the Arabian Nubian Shield located 200 kilometers north of Sentiment Sakari's world-class gold mine. Aton possesses first mover advantage in the underfollowed jurisdiction of Egypt, which is currently undergoing mining reform. To stay on top of Aton's latest drill results and news, go to AtonResources.com. Aton trades on the TSX-V under the ticker AAN and on the OTC under the ticker ANLBF. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Well, did you say what, what are the debt to equity ratios now for some of these big companies? Yeah. Um, yeah, they're, they're not... Just one third, correct? Yeah, IBM. You know, IBM is, and it, and it's just cheap financial engineering. Oh, don't even, don't right? even get me started on IBM. <laughs> yeah, well, but right, what uh, I'm saying, true. I'm, I'm incredibly bearish, yeah. and I have a bearish position. Full disclosure. Yeah. Um, okay. So fair enough. Know, I, I, um, when you, I mean, they bought Red Hat, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much saying, well, our existing business isn't working, so we're going to go a different direction again. And, um, and that usually doesn't work out too well. No, it always, uh, I, I, yeah. Can you, I can't even think when, I mean, I haven't thought about this. Maybe I'm trying to think of a company that's had a successful pivot out of what they did into something else. Oh, you mean um, like GE, right? No. <laughs> um, Blockbuster <laughs> failed. They couldn't pivot. GameStop couldn't pivot. Um, you're seeing these video game makers uh, not know what to do with the emergence of Fortnite, and they all are taking a massive hit. Yeah, uh, yeah I guess the one, the one is uh, one of the guys in my office is saying Microsoft, and uh, that's that's no, what Microsoft did. did uh, not quite, but I understand his point. But it has been a pivot, but they're still in the same business. Hey, what about the worst acquisition of probably the past two decades, Verizon? which was a phone company. They were great with pay phones. They were great with, uh, you know, putting copper into your home. Great with cell phones too, because that's ununionized section of the company. But they purchased AOL in one of those type of pivots. We're going to become an information provider, internet backbone. You know, uh, everybody will be uh, flocking, to, flocking to us. And they just wrote it down uh the value of their investment, I think they've now said from like 10 billion to 200 million. That's quite a hit. <laughs> you know, you should stick to what you know oh, best. My goodness. That's, that's a massive hit. And, and you know what? It's probably going to get, um, it's probably going to get beat by, by their uh, arch enemy, um, AT&T. AT and t buying the, the Time Warner deal. Yes. Yeah. Well, that, that actually could go down as a worse deal. You think so, huh? And I did a full pivot. I was I was bullish on AT and T for the wrong reasons, and then once I did more research and pretty much understood talk about debt, yeah. um, I realized that the AT and T just made no sense to own the company right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, the one thing is, the cell phone business is here forever until the satellite. Isn't that comes. crazy? Yeah, their AT and T and Verizon are in the best business. Yes. Right. And they got to screw it up. And they go mess it up. <laughs> like why do they, they, they just mess it up. And yep. you know why? Because mm. these companies are challenged to create these in, incredible uh, growth ratios, which are unsustainable. And um, a great example about that is Starbucks, which yeah. um, was getting company. beat down because they were trying to identify themselves as a growth company and every mm -hmm. earnings would be more of a traditional, you know, value company. And, and, and once they, I feel like, kind of accepted who mm -hmm. they are and mm -hmm. what they're good at, the stock became much more attractive. Correct. Um, you know, and I'd like to see that more in that. I think unless you're Amazon, 
um, take what you do well and keep perfecting your craft and you'll naturally get better and stronger and be able to charge more. But the mistake is to try to go outside your comfort zone, go into new areas, you know, compete with people that know what they're doing. And then call it, I mean, I guess we're getting a little fundamental here, but um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I like, I like when companies stick to what they know, unless you're yeah. Amazon, which yeah, I have well, a way to like perfect everything. Yeah, but uh, Amazon's doing a lot of dumb things like buying Whole Foods. You know, it's a grocery store. It's an overpriced grocery store. I shop there myself, but it's a limited market. Most people are not going to pay 80% of their paycheck to buy food at Whole Foods. They're just not going to do it. And maybe he's going to use each store as a drone launch pad for Amazon products. But short of doing that, I just don't see why bother with Whole Foods. Right. And, you know, we'll see what happens if in the next couple of months. I never really shop at Whole Foods anyhow, but if uh, we find ourselves in there checking out without speaking to humans, then um, I guess we're wrong. But, uh, yeah, no, I agree with you. There's still plenty of humans there. I was there a couple of weeks ago, and uh, the person that took my money, they did allow me to scan my uh, Amazon card so I could get another 37 cents off on the uh, order. But uh, short of that, I saw no synergies. And they've got a little kiosk there with Amazon, uh, I guess, Kindles and right, they're the Kindle, right? Amazon Kindles and, and tablets and stuff that they were selling. But, you know, it's another company. Like, why do these companies do that? Real flaw in American business. So getting back to the theme here, what we're talking about of the fact that, uh, you know, the market appears to be in a bear market. I'm not sure if it's confirmed yet, uh, but certainly, certainly well, the market. Mm. So the market's in uh, correction territory. Specific technology stocks are in confirmed bear market territory because they broke that 20 percent threshold. Right. So um, but the, the, the significant fact is that the stocks that are the tech stocks that are in what you would call bear market territory because they've had over a 20 percent correction are the ones that led to charge up. Mm -hmm. So logic would dictate that they're leading us down and the rest of the market will still, um, will still follow. And the last time you saw three, four, 500 point up days wiped out that day again and again and again, um, was 2008, 2009. I remember you'd be up, you'd be like, all right, finally we're rallying. And by the end of the day, we're negative. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I do think it's a, a sign. I think the buyers have to be tired. They've been beaten back too many times. Um, and I think for 10 years, it was a buy the dip mentality. And I do believe right now it is a sell the rally mentality. Now, as an individual trader, listen, I'll trade both sides of the market all day, every day. But I think overall, you've you, you got to give it a little more time to, to believe that these rallies won't last and expect um, the trend to continue to lower for a little bit. Mm. Well, it definitely looks like there's intervention, though, in the market. Uh, from whether you believe in there's a plunge protection team, president's uh, working committee on markets, et cetera. It just, the way it moves is kind of mind-boggling. The dollar is, is kind of still sitting pretty, though. We're going to see a dollar decline. I won't call it a crash because probably not a crash, but... Uh, certainly a decline from uh, the lofty area. I mean, Trump has said he doesn't want the dollar this high. Uh, I, you know, I, I think there's, I don't know if that will be in his control because, you know, you have all these countries at play against each other and so many moving parts that, um, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. tough, tough for me to speculate on that. Yeah. Yep. Very true. Well, no one expected it to go up when it did and they probably won't be expecting it to go down when it finally does go down, which it will at some point. Uh, there's an argument to be made, certainly. So feelings about uh, gold and other commodities, where do you think we are in the cycle there? I, I think gold is still something um, that you, it's hard to buy into. It, it's been um, it's been kind of dormant. It's been kind of like a dead industry. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a little pop recently, a little bit of a pop recently. Um, but not something, uh, and, and I guess it depends on where you are in your investing um, sphere. You know, mm -hmm. for me, as someone who has, um, you know, a, a long-term trajectory, uh, the marijuana sector remains more interesting. You know, mm -hmm. gold is obviously that safe haven, but I'd rather look for the growth 
um, in finding those um, the, the next big marijuana company. Um, mm-hmm. I do believe that cycle will last a lot longer than we saw with Bitcoin because it's tangible and it's becoming more deregulated. So that's that's what I'm paying attention to now. And I guess it's hard to cover everything. So gold for me is just not exciting right now. But you know, uh, which is why people invest in it. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not I'm not getting involved right now. It, totally. Well, so let's talk about the the cannabis industry. Uh, there's a lot of shady promoters in there, probably most of them. There's a few good companies. It's kind of like the dot coms in the late 90s. Uh, well, they've taken a hit, but they're all going up. But how do we tell the real ones from the fakes? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Right. And it's a little too early to tell. Um, more will be told about once there's deregulation. Uh, a, good, a good way to do it is to um, follow the smart money. So, you know, Altria just invested $1.8 billion in Kronos Correct. Uh, as the most recent deal. And I'm sure they did their research to invest that kind of money. I hope they did. Uh, and, and that one was an interesting play for me because you had, um, have you heard of uh, Citron Research, the guy that goes around and comes out with those short reports, uh, kind of makes targets of companies? Not familiar so, with him, but So he's, uh, Citron Research is, is they target companies and they write, for the most part, incredibly bearish mm-hmm. analysis on companies that they acknowledge they're short on. And they get enough exposure, they move the market. And, uh, Kronos was trading at like $9 and they did a takedown piece on Kronos about how it should be a $2 company, blah, blah, blah. And at the bottom they say, by the way, we're short and Kronos got hit for like 30%. Um, but eventually went back up through nine all the way to 13. They did the outfit deal. And I had emailed Citron research the day they would report. I'm like, this is just yeah. wrong of you guys. Um, you know, you didn't even really do research. You're just making very vague and general statements clearly to benefit for your own position. Um, I stayed long Kronos against them. Uh, mm-hmm. and you know, Kronos has gotten higher and Altria's valuation just confirms, um, that everything they did was wrong. So that's a little bit of a personal thing for me. It bothered me when they did it, it bothered sure. me how many news agencies picked it up, stock dropped 30%. I had to withstand that beating. Um, but, uh, you know, hey, you never know. One of the, one of, one of the rare times patience is, pays off, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting to think that, okay, Altria, which is uh, the reconstituted, I guess, domestic arm of Philip Morris. So if anybody knows about branding, and pretty much everyone I talk to says the the great companies of the future cannabis companies are going to be the ones that are most able to brand their products, uh, create superior brands, which means you know, a whole mix goes in there, quality and marketing and advertising, all that stuff goes in. But uh, you got to think that Philip Morris knows a thing or two about branding. They had the top, uh, you know, the top nicotine products uh, in the world for years and years and years. I mean, hundreds of billions of dollars in sales. So I guess there's a little bit of synergy in this one, isn't there? Um, <laughs> yeah, you're in New yeah, York, so that, we, we hear the sirens. I remember um, that often. About that. Yeah, it's, hey. I'm on the eighth floor, but you could hear them on the ground. I'm in New York. Um, yeah, yeah the, the big thing about Philip Morris is they're expert lobbyists. And, uh, yeah. you know, regulation is such a big thing in the marijuana industry. So to have them on their side, I thought was, uh, was a really big deal. Yeah, it was uh, definitely inspired. And, uh, and look, uh, they know how to roll tobacco, so I guess they can roll hemp. Uh, they can switch those factories over, right, to, uh, to be rolling uh, marijuana cigarettes. And, and they know how to brand, you know, everything they touch, you know, they're magical with branding. And like you said, the lobbying aspect, too, uh, although they couldn't hit off the inevitable, uh, but, you know, there's only less than 20% of the population smoking cigarettes now, and yet they're still making record profits. In spite of all the tobacco lawsuits, everything else that they paid out hasn't really made a difference in the profitability of the company. That's the kind of company you think is going to take the lead for this, but they don't want to be, say, all right, Altria, formerly known as Philip Morris, is out there pushing drugs. So instead, they invest through surrogates and build the brand there stealthily. Pretty smart, uh, pretty smart strategy there, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, and it's a great hedge for yeah. um, 
for them. You know, kind of if you can't beat them, join them. Yeah, well, eventually they'll um, come out with a cigarette that's harmless, but it might be too late by then. I mean, I don't care if a cigarette was good for you. I wouldn't be smoking it because I just find the whole habit disgusting. But uh, I guess perhaps there are those out there who would who would still jump at it. Yeah, uh, that would be, I, I'm sure it would be a great benefit. You know, they have that for marijuana habit, it's like the, <laughs> yeah. the vapor instead of the smoke. Yeah, again, they, <laughs> I don't. I don't participate, so <laughs> I, yeah. I'm not an expert on the subject. It's the industry. Same here, yeah. but but the e-cigarette business turned into a 6.6 billion dollar industry overnight. Philip Morris said that the cannabis industry, all forms of it, medical and uh, recreational, 56 billion dollar annual industry in the U.S. alone, and we got like a dozen other countries who were in the. Uh, various stages of legalizing. So, you know, the only thing is, uh, will this be an environment like uh, craft beer where people are looking for the quiche little uh, niche brand rather than, you know, and turning away from the uh, Heineken's and the uh, Budweiser's? That remains to be seen. But as an emerging market, it's fascinating and loads of potential. Adam, uh, hey, best place to find you these days, adammesh.com? Yeah, absolutely, adammesh.com. And, um, and you know, if uh, anyone wants to email me, adam at adammesh.com, tell them uh, they heard me here, I'll probably hook them up with a free surprise. Oh, hey. Okay. Well, hey, it's, uh, it's good that Christmas comes uh, once a year and we're right around there. Hey, anyway, Adam, always great talking to you. Wish you the happy holidays is the politically correct way of saying it, since probably you don't celebrate uh, Christmas either. But happy new year, and we'll talk to you uh, in 2019. Yeah, but I still say, you know, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, All happy right. New Year. I, I, believe in, I believe in giving everyone... Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I used to say happy holidays, and my, my audience did not like that. They're like, no, no. <laughs> hey. Celebrate the specific holidays. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. All right, I got it. Hey, it's I've, what, I've been learned. Right, it's what we did as kids. Everybody said Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and, uh, yeah. you know, I still think uh, we should, and, uh, you know, I think hopefully the trend has turned the corner, anti-religiosity, anti-American, you know, Judeo-Christian yeah. values. Hopefully that's that's going to swing back the other way now. You never know. Anyways, hey, if you've got a question for Adam and you want me to hook you up with him, just email me, kl at kerrylutz.com. Twitter feed at Kerry Lutz. Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. You YouTubers, please subscribe, like, and share. You non-YouTubers, you can share too. Spread the word about the show to your friends. Where else do you get so much information? And it's free. Adam, we'll talk to you next year. Thanks so much. Bye, Carrie. Happy New Year. Thanks. Bye. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.